and that's to win ball games. He is there also, yes, to be like a father figure and to help you and guide you along the way. But at the end of the day, he's paid by the university to win ball games. Athletes, entrepreneurs, and those who've embraced the necessary change for the better. They've endured, discovered, rebuilt. But what about you? What about you? Are you waiting for life? Or is life waiting for you? This is the come up. Come up. What's up, guys? Octavio here with the come up. And like every week, every podcast, I have a great, great friend of mine. Uh, Cameron Law, but before that, I have to announce, you know, we are sponsored completely by Recovery Through Repetition, but it's a pleasure to have you, man. I'm so happy you got to make it, man. My God, anytime. I appreciate it. I was a little bit tardy this morning, so... Oh! Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm happy. You stepped happy. in front of me real uh, quick. Yeah, got to, got to. I'm happy, happy, to have, happy that you're having me this morning. Nah, man, the time. pleasure's ours, man, and reality is that you know we've known each other for almost 60 days now and mm-hmm. maybe a little more because you went off on yes. that trip yeah we're gonna talk about that trip because it was super interesting mm-hmm. but i want to know the story man i want to talk about basketball you're gonna teach me some stuff and uh i want to yeah. know everything there is about the rise of mm-hmm. becoming a player and now a coach yeah and now you know you the whole journey of that man so let's talk about camera law and uh how it goes well you know i'm originally from morgantown west virginia born and raised uh i have uh two parents they've been married for 44 years have, that's amazing in itself yes okay. uh they have six brothers and sisters so they had seven kids together wow um i have 11 nieces and nephews 12 on the way uh, in like a matter of days if not minutes who knows whenever she's gonna pop so um yeah i'm a, i'm just a good old country boy from west virginia uh, that just grew up with humble beginnings and, and a great family, great support system around me. Uh, and at a young age, you know, playing on Montrose Avenue in Jerome Park, uh, growing up, we just did every sport possible. Uh, basketball, football, baseball, uh, dodgeball. Uh, we played tag. I mean, we were just outside. Oh, you know, outside. It, I you was part outside. of that generation. It was, it's totally different generation. Yeah. Totally different generation uh, than it is now. No gaming. Uh, yes. And, and, and so, you know, having parents that made good money, but having seven mouths to feed, we... We weren't the richest family in the neighborhood, uh, but we also weren't the poorest. It was like a, a middle to lower class. Okay. And so for us, we were always two game systems behind. So when everybody got a Nintendo, we got an Atari. When everybody got a Super Nintendo, we finally got a Sega. So when everybody got a PlayStation, we finally got a Nintendo. So it was like we were always two game consoles behind uh, in our family, in our household. And that's what made us appreciate um, really everything that we got um and so like i said we were outside a lot uh just playing nonstop, constantly doing any type of anything uh with physical activity and we like i said we grew up in that generation um and my parents were extremely and still are extremely supportive uh they were more hands-off parents um and i have a lot of kids that i do training with and and i work around the world and teach kids and teach basketball um and we've kind of heard that term helicopter parents. Uh, my parents were not like that. They were, we're going to give you the, we're going to give you the opportunity. We're going to give you the resources. We're going to, you know, uh, make sure that you get the practices and the trainings that you need to, but it's going to be on you. Um, and so they were very, very, um, you've got to get it done yourself. And to their credit, it worked because at six out of seven of us got athletic scholarships two in track and four in basketball. Wow. So, um, you know, from that blueprint, I'd say that, you know, being more hands-off and allowing the the, the child to want it themselves, um, it at least worked for them. So that's where I'm from. Uh, basketball, like I said, I kind of was born into that. My so dad's, are you the oldest or are you the I'm number five. I'm number five. Oh, wow. You know, so yeah. your brothers, you saw all your brothers and sisters are athletes. Yes. Yeah. I have an older brother. Okay. Uh, played college basketball, Taco Falls. I have an older sister. Mm-hmm. Uh, ran track at Marshall University in Kent State. Okay. Uh, older sister played basketball at UNC Greensboro. Have another older sister, just a regular student. She played high school sports, but you know, uh, didn't take it to the collegiate right. level. Uh, I played college basketball. My younger brother, uh, he played um, 
he ran he ran college track mm-hmm. um, at Wheeling Jesuit University, uh, Division two school, and then I had a another younger brother who played college basketball at Geneva College in Pennsylvania. So, uh, so how's the competition in your house? Oh, it was super competitive. It was very. <laughs> I like I, said, I like, want to know what Thanksgiving's like at that oh, house. It was man. super competitive. I'm, I'm a skinny guy, so obviously I didn't win the battles at the at the dinner table a lot. You know what I mean? I wasn't able to. Uh, that's how I learned how to box out because I was you know trying to get that piece of chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta box out your brothers and sisters right. to make sure that you know you can you can get that uh, get that food. But yeah, it was always competitive, man. We were just like I said, whether it was uh, racing down the street to the park or whether it was um, you know who could uh, you know chug a drink fastest. It was there was always competition in in the house, um, and and our parents really um, like I said allowed us to grow with that competition it was it was healthy competition it wasn't like you know we 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 learned at a young age how to win gracefully and also learned how to lose gracefully as well so uh it was it was it was fun um like i said uh, i'm number five my mom knows all of our names my dad he just knows us by numbers it's easier for him he for, you know he's old and senile now so you know he forgets he forgets our names actually it's funny because my younger brother his name is quinn mm-hmm. and my name is cameron and probably since I was about like 13, I've just responded to Cameron. It's a combination of the two, you know. That's my dad. He's just, uh, but he's, he's, a, he's a, he's a, he's a good old boy from West Virginia coal miner. And my parent, my mother, she worked for the FBI. That's amazing. And so uh, my dad also worked for the gas company for like 20 some years. My mom did fingerprint. So like I said, just when it comes to where I come from, I'm extremely proud of of having. Like, I know everybody says that they have the best parents, but I really do feel like uh, I have just amazing set of parents that really I allowed me to be the person I am. building block to personality building and for basically core values. Yeah. So let's talk. So you get to the second level, mm-hmm. right? You get to college. You get the ride. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Talk to me about the change from high school ball to being the man to going into a really structured environment. You know, it it was um, it was a easy transition because basketball is the same. The speed changes and the the size of the guys and the strength changes, but you'll 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 make that adjustment. The hardest change was having all this time on your hands. You're in high school. You go to high school. You go to school for eight hours a day. You go there. You get to, just get to school at seven thirty. You leave at three thirty. And then you go to basketball practice at 3.30 until like 5. Now, you might have one class at 9 a.m. and then practice at 2. And then that's your day. And now you have to juggle uh, prioritizing and making sure that you have all your stuff together. So that was the biggest adjustment uh, adjustment for me uh, was just, like I said, having all this time and making sure you're prioritizing. I had a really, really great coach uh, in Bryanport at West Virginia State. I went there first uh, for two years. I redshirted my first year. Um, it was a tough decision for them to redshirt me or to play me, uh, but they saw that you know we were pretty, we were actually not pretty, we were really good my freshman year. Okay. So they said, let's get an extra year out of this guy uh, whenever we have some of our you know, juniors. Get some reserves. Yeah, yeah juniors and seniors, they're, tra- they're, they're going to be graduating. So uh, we're gonna redshirt him and you know develop him, let him learn the offense, get him stronger, so on and so forth. So let me stop you there. Mm-hmm. How does that make you feel? Because sometimes that hurts. Yeah. A lot of a lot of athletes don't like. That. They mm-hmm. want to play. Yeah. So how did that like really affect you? Did it make you grind harder? I mean, what was the mentality there? What you know, the honestly, I was I, I was not. Um, I won't. I won't say that I wasn't happy about it. I know that I was. I, I felt like I was good enough okay. to play early Which is great. and often. Yeah, and and they told me that they said we know you're capable of playing with us right now, but what we can do is instead of you getting four minutes here, four minutes there this year, maybe. You know, as a freshman coming in, giving the guy a spell and coming in doing well, we want to, you know, when you're coming in on your red shirt freshman year, we want to be able to give you 10 or 12 minutes. And then somebody's giving you a spell and then you're going back in and finishing out the half. Uh, so that was kind of their mindset. And, and, 
And then I realized, you know what? I do need to get stronger. Uh, I like I said, I said early in the podcast, I was a little bit, you know, skinnier guy, uh, like Ethiopian wonder. Uh, no one's ever said that I was skinny. So that bothers me. <laughs> ever. Never had that problem. But. Or tall. Or tall. <laughs> wow. Zinger. Shots fired. I dig Shots it. Fired. I dig it. Okay. <laughs> Right on. All right. But good looking, my friend. But hey, but good I have looking. a great beard. I'll you, you that. butt good looking. They, 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 <laughs> they have told you you're good looking. All right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're married and I'm not. Exactly. <laughs> so, how much weight did he put on? Um, probably like 12 pounds. Again, I didn't... And how hard was it? Because oh, it was, it was extremely hard. I, I, I would literally be in the cafeteria with coach jackson just he'd be sitting there making me eat just like eat 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 non-stop constantly and um it was tough because like i said my metabolism was just so fast i would literally get up to you know change the tv or turn off the light in our dorm and i'd lose like five pounds you know that's that was i was just was burning calories right. you know uh, so it was it was tough. Not to mention, you know, you're eating and you're you're doing weight training, but then you're also doing conditioning and you're also playing every single day. Um, and at that point in time, I really wanted to be in the best shape that I possibly could going into my redshirt freshman year. Right. So I was swimming as well. I mean, I was doing everything that I could do because. Yes, I might not be the biggest guy in terms of strength, but I was looking at a guy, you know, Kevin Garnett. You know, I was looking at the big ticket, and I was saying, all right, he's not the biggest guy, but he's strong, so he can hold his own right. on that block just because um, he might not look physically strong, but he can be strong. So I just wanted to kind of replicate my game like him. Uh, so I was doing everything that I possibly could, like I said, to be in shape. So, um, yeah, it was tough gaining weight. It was really tough, but I was able to do it. Um, I was finally able to like to crack that 200 mark, probably you know at the end of my red sh- at the end of my red shirt year. Um, I was like at 198, and then finally get to 199, and boom, like I was like 202, you know. Yeah. So I was like, got it, you know, and I just right. was able to maintain it from there uh, with everything that the coaches put in place for us. Okay, so red shirt freshman year comes mm-hmm. up, you get your play time. I didn't, you know. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, and, and, and rightfully so. I, I did not perform well in the preseason. I really didn't. Um, uh, whether it, you know, I, I just came into it not mentally right or whether I came into it uh, maybe overly confident knowing that, okay, like they said all these good things. Um, I just didn't play as best as I possibly could in the preseason. I had spurts, but I wasn't consistent. Okay. And that's that's what I preach to my kids now. So, you know, I, I can speak from experience about right. consistency. It's not one of those things where I'm just talking about consistency, consistency. If you're not consistent, a coach has a job to do, and that's to win ball games. He is there also, yes, to be like a father figure and to help you and guide you along the way. But at the end of the day, He's paid by the university to win ball games, so I don't blame you know the coaching staff or any way, any shape or form for at West Virginia State, for you know my playing time, and I got my opportunities. And when I when I got my opportunities, I was able to grow a little bit through them, um, and maximize you know some playing time here okay. and there. Um, and I got you know if I was able to get one minute, then the next. Next game, I got two minutes. And then the next game, I got two minutes and 45 seconds at a time. You know what I mean? And so I I progressively got better as the season went along. And that was because I realized, you know what? You're already starting uh, behind on the eight ball. Now you weren't consistent in the beginning. Now you've got to maintain that consistency. And sometimes playing time, I was consistent once the season started going through practice. But sometimes playing time, uh, it, it, it... as a coach, knowing it now, there could you could be doing everything right as a player and still not get that playing time because the guy in front of you is doing what he's doing yeah. and he's been doing what he's doing. So if he's staying consistent and he hasn't dropped off, you know, uh, you got to do what's best you, for the you've team. Got, exactly, you got to do what's best for the team. So I completely understood that 100 percent at West Virginia State. And you were maturing it as an adult. Yes, too, exactly. Time, so you yeah. got to see it. it, it and and I. I wasn't a part, like I said, we talked about that generation, I'm a little bit older, and I'm not a part of that 
everyone gets a trophy. We're not going to keep score type of generation. So at that point, I was like, you know what? And there was no going back to like, you know, talking to your dad and crying home. I mean, this is a guy who, you know, was working, you know, 18 hour days to provide for seven kids. He's not going to listen to you talk about not getting a fair shake. He, you know, the, 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 there's there's no excuses. My dad always says, my dad always said, excuses are made up lies. So like that. we uh, we we don't we don't have excuses in the law household at all. All right. So talk to me about. So you went through a longer journey because you transferred. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. So let's talk about this transfer and how you got to that because the way you speak about your coach mm-hmm. says that you're supportive, a good mentor. Yeah. And that must have been a hard decision to make. It was. It was. It was a really hard decision. I'm. I. Make a long story short, uh, my best friend was playing at the school that I transferred at. And he was talking with his coach, and his coach was saying, we were in the same conference, and his coach was seeing, <laughs> yeah, so his coach was seeing that, hey, you know, I... I not I, getting I, enough playing Yeah, this time. guy's not getting enough playing time. I know that you're really good friends with, you know, Cameron. Like, we'd love to have him. Like, 6'8", you know, guy that can shoot, stretch the floor, plays a small forward, shooting guard, power forward. And, you know, obviously he's 6'8", so he can even play the center. Um, you know, if he's interested, we got playing time for him up here. Um, and they were in a rebuilding program. The year before my best friend had gotten there, that team had, like, five wins, maybe. And then my my their freshman year, my best friend, he was freshman of the year. He was uh, uh, freshman of the year in the conference. Mm-hmm. Um, he was he was uh, leading scorer on their team, and they went from, like, five wins to, like, 20 wins all in one year. Wow. And so this coach, he had said that, you know, it was going to be, uh, you know, Cameron could have been an integral part and, in, again, building even more. Right. And so, you know, my friend, he was talking to me, and he's, like, my best friend. So he's like, hey, you know, like, you got this is going to be a great place for you. Like, I'll give up five of my shots to give them to you if you come here. Like, you know, I, he was averaging, like, you know, 15 to 20 shots a game. He's like, I'll, I'll shoot less. Like, you know, kind of like a Dwayne Wade and LeBron James. Like, yeah. Dwayne Wade behind the scenes is recruiting Chris Bosh and LeBron yeah, James. Yeah. Like, let's make a power team. Like, so I was, you know, it was back and forth, and I was like, I really like it down here. And, like, I know that Coach Poor has my best interest. But also, everybody wants to play. And everybody. And you want to play. Yeah, and I want to play. Putting the work yes. and even doing all the things. Yeah, so. I want to play. Um, I remember going into Coach Poor's office and just like, I was really emotional because, again, these guys had been battling with them for, you know, last two years. And he's Coach had my Coach back. Battles, yeah. yeah, he's had my back and, and so on and so forth. And like I said, I just sat down with him and. And he completely understood, and but also in that same breath, he was, you know, he saw that I could have transformed into something under his program as well, and uh, he was great, man. Um, and so I transferred to West Liberty, uh, and I got to West Liberty, and I got hurt, like I I had tore my calf up immediately, not immediately, probably like two weeks into the preseason, and I was out for like four weeks maybe five just just hurt and um what happened was you know the you know when you're hurt you can't see anybody and the other guys progress so i you know i was doing my rehab with you know, our trainers and i was doing it in the pool and i got back and you know i was again behind the eight ball again again and there was a so let's pause yeah okay so far in your story we have two big pauses already, right? So mm-hmm. we have this. So young man, you're about 20 now, right? Yeah. With another injury. Mm-hmm. The mindset to come back, right? Because, yeah. right, so you put in the work, you get it done, you reach 202. You get the red shirt freshman year, and you don't perform the way you want to. Mm-hmm. Feel behind the eight ball. So you use that terminology twice. Yeah. So it's not behind the eight ball. It's more like your expectations of yourself yes. and your teammates of mm-hmm. what they're expecting of you. So that makes you feel what at the second time, right? So yeah, you can oh, curse, man. God. <laughs> Felt like shit. Felt like shit. I'm awful, man. Awful. Right. I, it, it was. It was. It was literally. It was literally a terrible. It. it it does a lot to people 
mentally to be injured, hurt, unhealthy, sick, whatever it is, you know, and this is a guy, this is a, a, a guy, a kid, a young man, whatever you want to say, that has an injury, and again, big fish, little pond in high school, now little fish, big pond, um, in college, you he just got recruited, so you're feeling good. Yes. So I'm like, I, I know I'm going to come in here and I'm going to literally be back where I was in terms of like just going out there and playing my game. And boom, injury happens. And it was like, it wasn't like a cut or something like that. It was literally, I went up and one of my teammates accidentally kicked my heel. Uh, not my heel, my calf. And it was a deep bruise in the calf. And it was it was a really, really, really deep bruise. And, and it's painful because you push off and everything. Yes, that, that that's everything. <laughs> that's everything. So, you know, I was I was I was devastated. Like I said, it was just awful. So, you know, going into that year. So you know the name of this podcast, right? The come up? Talk to me about the come up here, man. Yeah. This, it seems like this is the one, right? This is the beginning. Yes. So here we go. So, you know, here we go. Um, all of a sudden, one of the the guys in front of me, a um, good friend of mine, Chris Blair, he gets hurt. We're playing in D.C. against uh, one of the teams, and he gets hurt right in the middle of a game. Like probably, I don't know, 14 minutes left in the second half, and we're down. I think we're down like five or seven at that point in time. Coach puts me in the game. And I come in and I just do what I do. <laughs> and it wasn't like I went out there and I had like 30 points in the second half. I just was able to defend the basket. I was a rim protector and then I was able to grab certain rebounds and then I was able to crash the boards offensively. And then again, yeah, stretch the floor. I was I was one of those tall guys that shot, you know, perimeter three pointers. And and so just just with that energy and that difference and that spark. It was a game changer for me. Yeah. So I was able to get that. Um, and I was able to maintain that playing time throughout the rest of the season. Um, then my junior year, uh, my redshirt junior year, this was probably the worst. It was just, it was just like one of those things where um, I still look at my coach sometimes and I... I just have this burning resentment, resentment towards him. Uh, I just went in for the jump ball. Okay. That's it. I got the jump ball for the team. Mm-hmm. And I... That's it. I just got the jump ball. And then the first dead ball, I would come out of the game. Okay. That's it. That's it. I was... I went You're in... the jump ball guy. I went in for the jump ball. And after that, come out of the game. Immediately. And I sat the rest of the game. I was, he saw a talent, he exploited it, he used it, but guess what? I'm not an individual guy. I don't do swimming. I don't do golf. If that's what I'm going to do to help our team win, I'm going to do it. We had 25 games, let's say 25, 30 games. I only lost two jump balls. I was, if I'm going to have, if I'm going to have a job, I'm going to do it well. I'm going to do it damn well. Okay. So I lost maybe two jump balls that whole season. And, uh... Yeah, it was it was it was really tough to take that and swallow it and to not say anything. And really it was it was tough. And I'll never forget, man, my dad is not a he's not a helicopter parent. He's not. It was a game where uh, we were playing close to home so it was within travel distance for them to go watch. And I did my job, mm-hmm. got the jump ball, and then after the game, my dad was literally going to strangle this man. And he just stood over top of him, didn't say a word, just stood there and just was, and I just was like ushered him away and I said, Dad, it's bigger than basketball, it's okay. It's bigger than basketball, I'm getting a degree, I'm getting school paid for, they're gonna use me, I'm gonna use them. Yeah, that's it. And that's what? So that's I, what your mentality switched to? Yes. So I okay. said, okay, that's fine. I'm gonna be the best footballer. That's it, whatever. I'm gonna get my degree? Yeah. 
So then, you know, fast forward, that was it. And then I was debating on, you know, what I want to do. Like, I've already transferred once. I don't want to transfer again. I'm just going to stick it out. I have one more year. I remember okay. my, red shirt, fresh, my red shirt senior year now. And I played. I, I did really well. I played. I was. I started for them. And, and uh, you know, I, I balled out. You know, I, I did what I was always capable of doing, just not given the opportunity. There are a lot of people in life like that. You know, there are a lot of people in life that are capable of doing something. They're not given the opportunity. And when they're given that opportunity, then people are surprised by, like, where was this? It's always been here. It, you just were dumb and, or are stubborn or, not, or right. doubted it and to see it. You right. know what I mean? But the, I think... So opportunity always is for who gets it, right? Obviously. Sometimes you don't get it and you make it your own mm-hmm. and you make sure you get it. The question that I think a lot of athletes go through, right, is okay, senior year's over. Yeah. Because what's the percentage of that GoPro? I know you know it. Mm-hmm. What's life after the game? Because the game was everything you had for a while. You, I mean, you got a degree out of it. Yeah. So now what? You know, that was the decision you had to make, right? Yeah, that was. And so I actually was really debating on what I wanted to do. So I went back home and and um, I worked for this guy, Nate Smith, Nate Smith Basketball School in Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh, he's a professional player in Holland and Poland and just like one, the best shooter I've ever seen in my life. Like the best shooter, and I've seen professional athletes at the NBA level. He's not, I've never seen anybody shoot better than him. He's just, he's a great guy. Um, he's family. He's been a mentor of mine. And I worked for him. And I did basketball training. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did that actually during my whole college career when I went back during the summer. Right, so I always there. helped okay. him. And so when I went back, I had a full time job and he put me on salary and I was doing that training with him and I also was with WVU's basketball team as a student assistant and I was um, coaching with Bob Huggins and their staff uh, in 2010, 2011. And so I had uh, two mentors, two great people in my life, Bob Huggins and Nate Smith, that were teaching me the game and giving me opportunities uh, beyond playing. And I had a little small time where I, you know, I had played and and uh, did some, you know, semi-pro stuff, and I had a, well, I had played with the Harlem Globetrotters, and I had that opportunity, which is really cool. I, I think you downplay that a lot. I, I do, so, I do. And I kind of don't. I'm not gonna let you slide on it because <laughs> just being part of that is like name. Mm-hmm. I get goosebumps just saying about it because every time you say Harlem Globetrotter, yeah. I don't know one person that doesn't smile. It it was a fun experience, man. It was so it was going into it a little bit because I think you downplayed a lot. Yeah, I do, and you know, and and again, I lucked into it. A guy had missed his flight. They were down a player. They needed somebody to step in, and I did. And then I, I, that's where it was. <laughs> and so I was able to play with them and have a have 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 a fun time. And 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 it was literally one of the best experiences of my life. Uh, it, it, it just was, it was just so fulfilling to see the crowd. And I was, I was just honored to be a part of that team. You know, even if it was short lived and I had torn my MCL so I couldn't, right. you know, prolong it again. Right. And I, I, that was the, that, that I had tore my MCL five times, four times in my left knee, one time in my right knee. I tore my meniscus in my right knee. And so there was a lot of injuries, just a lot of setbacks. I was a fragile guy and man, there were a lot of setbacks uh, mentally and physically. And so once I had torn it when I was playing with them a little bit after, I was like, you know what? I just don't want to do the rehab anymore. And I just don't want to. You know, I can do things beyond this playing that are still impactful in the game of basketball. There it is. I can still hear the ball bounce. That's what I've been hearing. I've yes. been wanting to hear this whole conversation, right? Beyond the game. Mm-hmm. Right. But you're still in the game. Yes. Still in More it. involved than ever, I, yeah. I, I gotta believe. So I so I'm so I'm with, you know, Nate Smith doing the training in Morgantown, West Virginia, and I'm having a ball doing it. We're doing tournaments, we're doing trainings. I'm, you know, I'm living on my own. I'm making a good living. Developing athletes. Developing athletes, making an impact with kids. Mentoring. Mentoring, so on and so forth. And it's around like 2011, 2012. I say to myself, 
I want more. And to just be in my hometown, where I'm originally from, in Warrington, West Virginia, I want to... I want to do something. I want to spread my wings. There I want it to fly is. away. I want to, you know, like I, I, I love my state, man. Country roads, West Virginia. There's nothing better, man. It's God's country. Right. I love where I'm from. I real, I love it, man. And but, but I, but I, but I wanted to see where I could take this basketball and where I could go with it. And so I made a decision. I packed up everything that I had in my car, and I literally moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I partnered up with the guy that played in the NBA and is from West Virginia, played at Marshall University, uh, played for the uh, Bobcats, and played for uh, the Nets, mm -hmm. to Marsley. Okay. And we partnered up together, and we did the same concept in terms of basketball training that I did with Nate Smith. Right. But I did it in Charlotte, North Carolina. So okay. I lived with my aunt. Yeah, so I relocated. Lived with my aunt, my aunt Rachel, and... Um, Shout out to Aunt Rachel. Yeah, love my aunt Rachel, man. She was like... She was my aunt, but my mother for seven or eight months. I mean, we sat every, almost every single night, watched Family Feud, cooked dinner, had just like breakfast together. Obviously, this is my mother's sister. Right. And um, she did not treat me like her nephew. She treated me like her son. And there's... How it, special is that? Man? It's, it's amazing because I remember uh, one time overhearing my parents say like our kids have never played an away game because we have family everywhere right. so if they're playing in oklahoma there's family if they're playing in ohio there's family if they're playing in north carolina there's family if they're playing in south carolina virginia florida there's family across the everywhere. nation somewhere so they've never had an away game because there's always family there to come and support them and i had that with my aunt rachel and my cousin elise and uh they were like i said just awesome Okay. And uh, so I went down to Charlotte, North Carolina, and I partnered up with Tamar Slay, and everything was going great and awesome and wonderful. And then my brother was retiring from the Marines at the time, and he was debating on whether to go into the police department in Charlotte, North Carolina, or Baltimore, Maryland. And he chose Charlotte, North Carolina. So then I said, well, you know, I've kind of crashed long enough. And so now I'll just get in apart with my brother, and we still had, we still had dinners at my aunt Rachel. We right. still came over there on the weekends and things like that, and hung out with her. And uh, I still was doing the basketball training with my brother. I'm living with my brother now, and I was again given an opportunity. Mm -hmm. There was a head coaching job at a private Christian school in Charlotte that opened up, and I was not interested in taking it. One of the parents of the kids that I trained said, you know what, you should, you should apply. Just apply. Just apply, just apply. And I said, ah, I'm really, I, I, I'm doing this, doing this training stuff. I'm not really, you know, interested in it. He said, well, it'd be good to just get that experience to go through the interview process. process. Right. You know, the process and so on and so forth. So filled out the application, applied, and there were over, I think, 100 people that had applied for this thing. And it was... It was, it was pretty. It was pretty cool to be narrowed down. So they narrowed it down to like actually 40 people that they were looking at. Then they narrowed it down to like 20 people that they were looking at. And I came in on the 22nd hour of the 24th hour. Right. And so I put on my resume, put in my application, and I met with the athletic director and I met with the women's coach who was on the board of you know hiring the head women's coach. Um, and they were awesome. They were just, like I said, really cool. And it was kind of like an unofficial interview, first interview. So I met with them after the application. They brought me in for the second interview. Now with the president of the boosters, the vice, the vice principal, the principal, the headmaster, the athletic director, the assistant athletic director, the women's coach, the whole shebang. The whole yeah. crew. So I'm in there. I have my interview. And I just tell them I'm not what you're traditionally going to probably right. be used to. Right. It's a private Christian school. I I coach pretty fiery. I'm from the Bob Huggins school of coaching. I'm not without the curse right? without the four letter words, you know. <laughs> uh, and so I said, you know, I'm not I'm not here to baby the kids or the young men. I'm here to coach them and also mentor them, but you're hiring me to be your basketball coach. So we're going to win ball games, and I'm going to completely change things around if you guys are okay with that. And I said, I really appreciate the opportunity. And 
I didn't think anything of it because, again, I came in at such a late time in the interview process, mm-hmm. and I was their last interview. But I was the last thing on their mind and maybe the most impressionable. And I got the job. Two days later, I got a phone call. I got the job. They had a press release. The year be- great. Yeah. The year before I had gotten the job, they were 2-19. and 19. Okay. So I'm sitting here saying, I'm going to this, like, the only thing I can do is be worse if we win one game. We can match it and win two games, but if we get win only one game, I did worse. Now, if we win three games, that is a win percentage that we we've already we've double already up. exceeded our win percentage. Yes, so we're good. We win four games, like you said, we double up two hundred percent. So I said, okay, we're good. And the kids really bought into what we were selling. Our coaching staff. The very first time I met with them, there were eight basketballs laying on the court. I said, everybody bring it in. Everybody bring it in. I don't I don't ever use a whistle with my practices right. or any type of training. I haven't used a whistle in twelve years. Just my voice is what you should hear, listen for. If you hear it, stop what you're doing. So I said, everybody bring it in. This is the very first time I ever met them. They all brought it in. They dropped the basketballs. Eight basketballs laying around the court. Some of the guys had the balls in the hand. And I said, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're going to do ten burpees for every basketball that is on the floor right now. You guys leave these basketballs on the floor. You don't have respect for them. You just drop them. You're carefree with them. You have to protect these things. You have to love these things. If you have a baby, you're just going to leave it laying around on the floor. You're going to pick it up. You're going to take it wherever you go. It's the same thing with these basketballs. So 10 burpees right now for every basketball. That's 80 burpees. This is me not even saying I'm Coach Law. I haven't even said I'm that's Coach Law. That's your welcome, gentlemen. This is me right now. They finish their burpees, and I say, Coach Law... Coach Cam, I'm not like a stickler for, you know, you call me Coach Cam, you call me Coach Law, whatever, you know, whatever. You feel comfortable. Now, do you guys understand where I'm coming from now? And from that point forward, everything changed. They were like, oh, shit, yeah. this is, this is, real. This is different. Right? This is, this is, this is different. Okay. So, you know, we started open gyms, we started our off-season workouts, and I've already rambled on long enough. I'll skip through to the end of the season. Final record. Boom. 13 and 11. Boom. <laughs> we go from 2 and 19 to 13 and 11. First time they've had a winning season in school history. Wow. Or maybe since 2007. I can't remember whether it was 2007 or whether it was first, first time, time in school history. This was 2000 and 2015, uh, 2016 season. Um, first time in like eight years. Wow. Boom. Winning, winning record. And the, way, and the way North Carolina does it, it's like... You have to, it's like a selection committee. Right. Twelve teams make it to the playoffs. We were number thirteen. Oh. We uh, we got the final polls. We were number thirteen. We did not make the playoffs. Um, so that's fine. We knew we were going to build right. on that. We front loaded our schedule. We back loaded our schedule. We played all the top teams in the and we were ready. The next year we had a re- same returning team. All, right. all the other teams were returning guys. Or maybe losing a guy or two. Right. So we had the exact same team returning, and then we had other teams that were returning. So we wanted to play these same teams, but then also branch out and play teams in Greensboro, branch out and play teams uh, in Durham, North Carolina, and so on and so forth, and travel and like right. really try to boost our resume. Even if we lose, but we lose respectably, strength it's strength of schedule, so we can help ourselves out. I get a phone call on Labor Day. Uh, from my best friend, the one that had recruited me in college. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> and he says to me, do you have a minute? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, wait, I'm going to conference call somebody in real quick. I I want you to listen to what they have to say. And I'm like, okay. He's like a real good friend of mine. His name's Cody Toppert. Um, you know, just, just hear what he has to say. And I said, okay, sounds good. So conference in Cody. Cody's like, hey, Cameron, I've heard much about you. I'm with the Houston Rockets and their G League team with the Rio Grande Valley Vipers. We're looking for somebody with player development that, you know, can work our guys out and train them and, and also be, you know, on our coaching staff. And uh, Shane's talked a lot about you, so we're, you know, we're really excited to potentially have an opportunity to bring you in on our staff. I'm like, oh, gosh. <laughs> This is an NBA franchise calling me out of the clear blue as I'm watching Florida State versus Old Miss on Labor Day weekend, Monday night. And 
here we are. So I'm like, okay. So I'm back and forth, and I go through the interview process with them. And at the time, they were traveling abroad, and they were playing their preseason games in China and so on and so forth. Uh, and um, so it was like a 12-hour time difference, and I'm working with them to kind of do the interview process. And still coaching. And still coach. So I'm doing the phone interview process. They're doing all this and that. And I get the news that I got the job. Now I have to make a decision. Tough choices. Yes. And I told them, I said, I am the head coach. So if I get the job, I still Need to finish give, the give me 48 hours to, you know, let you know, hope, please, you know, to if I decide to decline it or not take accept the offer, you know, let me think about it. Talked over with my parents, uh, my um, girlfriend at the time. And I said, you know. I probably can coach any, just about any high school basketball team in the country at some point in time in my life. To get a call from an NBA franchise at a clear blue doesn't happen to just anybody. So I take the job and I have to break the news to my players. And it was tough. It was really tough. It was an emotional time. My players had no clue it was coming. Uh, I had all the middle school there because we had a feeder program. So we were, right. playing, we were working our middle school players out to learn the offense. That way when they get to high school, they had already been playing with it and been They're doing it. Speed, right? So the middle school program was there. The high school program was there. The JV program, the varsity players, I had over 60, 70 people in attendance to get this announcement. And they were really a great, great family to me. Shout out to Covenant Day School and uh, Matthews, North Carolina, man. They they accepted me for who I was, and they welcomed me with open arms. Um, it, even for that one year, it was it was truly truly a great experience and a, so and and relationships up. that lasted. That's awesome. Yeah, and they they didn't they obviously understood. But you you were open and honest. Yes. That it was a great opportunity. They understood. They supported. Yeah. And and I and we waited on this announcement for like three weeks while the athletic director could, find, could somebody. find somebody else to fill the gap and do the interview process and so on and so forth. And they kept it under wraps because, you know, they just, you know, yeah, so on. They didn't want to. Yes. Not yeah. Prepared. Yeah. So uh, I had to break the news to them. And, um, you know, the following year, they went three and 18 after we had left. Right. So, you know, I don't say it was us as a, as as a coaching staff and what we schemed or the plays that we ran or anything like that. I just think it was honestly the mindset that we gave them that you had a season that was two and 19. We're going to have to come up. We're going to go 13, 11. And I always told them if we play the Charlotte Hornets, we're going to beat them. We're going to beat them. That's what we have to think. We can't go into and say, well, you know, we no, we're going to beat the Charlotte Hornets. Like, we're not going to play conservative. We're going to play aggressive and high speed. And I think that was the difference with my style as opposed to previous coaches or past coaches that they've had um, is maybe they didn't have that um, extra push of confidence from other coaches that I wish that they would have. You know, because it again, it's bigger than basketball. It's not about winning ball games on the court. It's about winning that interview. It's about winning that girl. It's about w w winning every single day and seizing the opportunity in front of you. And that's what we try to instill in them: is that you can win at all costs, and you can win any situation in life. So now, with that transition, let's go into being an entrepreneur now. Yeah, because that must have been another switch, right? So you went from coaching now. Inside out training. Yeah, so so I was with the Houston Rockets and that was an awesome experience. I'm mean, gonna like say Cody Topper, Matt Brazzi, Joseph Blair, Gustavo, uh, Gus Garza. Uh, I mean, I mean, if I forgot anybody, Travis Stockbridge, Jimmy Paulus, Daryl Morey. Uh, these guys were just awesome to me. Right. Hondo, uh, Craig Skinner. Um, like Manny, my Manny Fresh, my guy. He's a massage. He's the best masseuse ever, man. He's massage he's therapist. massage therapist. Yes, we won't say masseuse. Yes, massage therapist ever. He's he's the man. But uh, there were uh, Nick Friedman. There were a lot of people that were just like I said, friends at the beginning, colleagues, and now they're family. Right. Um, and so I was with them. I left. 
I came down to South Florida to help my best friend, again, the one that recruited me. I came down here to South Florida to help him out with his prep school uh, and do personal training for his prep school. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, I had moved down here in May of 2017. Mm -hmm. And in August, August 4, 2017, he took his own life. Mm. Yeah. Um, he took his own life. And so I had Sorry a decision. It's okay. I appreciate it. You know, everything happens for a reason. Um, and I genuinely, truly do believe that uh, one tragedy can be uh, devastating to yeah, yeah. the people involved in it. But it can be something that others benefit from and that's terrible you might say that that's terrible to think from but like i was brought down here by my best friend shane and if he had not brought me down here regardless of the circumstances that surrounded his death there are so many kids in south florida that i wouldn't have been able to reach or touch or coach so i was brought down here for a reason by him unfortunately he you know again he wasn't he wasn't here to see you know what inside out trainings become but anyway, came down here and uh, to help him out with the training, and uh, I had a decision to make. Was I going to go back into potentially trying to chase an NBA coaching job again? Because now, you know, my best friend's gone, and he's so there's really that's the main reason why I was down here. So I ended up staying, and I ended up staying to help some of the kids that I, that we were training transition through that tough time in their life. And so I started doing some training with some kids locally just to kind of coach them every single day. And my brother from another mother, friend, I started training his son, Joseph Fuentes, uh, Joe Fuentes. Uh, I like his last name? Oh, great guy. Great guy. Yeah. And I um, trained his son. He was the first kid that I started training and I just started working with. And I said, you know what? I'm gonna work with this kid every single day for two hours a day at the time he's being homeschooled. And so that that got me the opportunity to work with other kids. And so I said, you know what, I need to do this right and do it legit. So I started doing training, I started the company. And Joe Fuentes was very instrumental in bringing me other kids and other parents that wanted their kids to have training and wanted their kids to have mentorship and a program that would be um, influential for them on the court and influential for them off the court. More importantly, off the court. Uh, I think that's huge. Right? Yeah. So let's talk. So I think every athlete or anybody that's ever played an organized team sport has one of those coaches they love, had another coach that just didn't do anything for them. And now you're seeing this kind of like a hybrid, right? Because I see coaches that care, which there's always been, mm -hmm. but now that are more in the mentorship keeping the right things, values, not only on the court, but off, right? And yeah. I think it's always been there, but now it's a little bit more open to be, you know, just more of a mentor, period, mm -hmm. right? Would you tend to agree to that? Of course, or? of course, you know. Because it's always been there, right? Yeah, of course. You know, and, and that's the biggest thing that I think a lot of my parents have said to me is that um, you aren't going to get my son or daughter to the NBA. Probably not. More, more, more likely than not. But what you're doing is you're teaching them life skills. You're teaching them things that I've said a hundred million times over, but whenever you say it, it's the gospel. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And you're teaching them things that are going to go far beyond the basketball court or far beyond the weight room. And so that's yeah, the, the, the mentorship that, that I have with these young men and these young women is the most rewarding and satisfying thing that I have in my life outside of my family. Uh, and, and it's just, it's been a blessing beyond my wildest dreams. Beyond my wildest dreams. I have parents that still email me, text message, uh, send me cards um, from my coach way back with Nate Smith. 
<laughs> and they still get Christmas or phone calls or, or, or happy birthday wishes. I still get wedding invitations or coach. I just had my first son or first daughter. Uh, the team from Covenant Day. I literally was just texting with them last week. Uh, like we're in a group chat. Like these kids, I coached them for one year and I had an impact with them that we have a group chat That's together awesome. and still talk and communicate. So um, again, it's it's been awesome just being able to have uh, an impact with them and that's those are just the kids and the students that I train I still talk with the professional athletes that I train and right. coach you know and still checking in on them and I, I remember one of the professional athletes that I have that I have had and have um, he, he, he blatantly said to me you're the first coach that's taken an interest in me outside of basketball like you don't talk to me about the basketball you do obviously but the you're the, one of the fir- few, first and few things that you always talk about is, how are you doing? How's the family? How's your daughter? How's this? And I've had athletes, professional athletes. I've had you know players talk to me about anything and everything from you know, you know, uh, every therapist as well. Oh no question, no question. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a glorified uh, babysitter, therapist, basketball coach, trainer, mentor. <laughs> Uh, older big brother. brother, oh, big brother. I mean, I'm talking. It, uncle, I mean, everything. Friendly years. Yes, it's it's everything, man. I've 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 done anything and everything throughout the course of. You Talk know. to me a little bit about the vision, man. So I know you were overseas mm-hmm. the last couple of weeks. Yeah. So now you're coaching overseas. You're starting this huge program here in South Florida. It's growing leaps and bounds. But yeah. what's the vision? What's the? So the ultimate goal, you know, eventually is just to change the way we do basketball down here in South Florida. Uh, You know, we have inside out training and I would put my resume up against just about anybody here in South Florida in terms of coaching at every single level. Coach middle school. Well, first off, I'll I'll take it even a step back. Uh, When I was a student assistant, I did, I coached my nieces third grade and fourth grade team, rec team. So I've coached rec teams at a younger level. I've coached middle school. I've coached in high school, been a head coach. I coached in college, went to the final four with Bob Huggins. I coached at the professional level. I've trained everybody from a four-year-old all the way up to the the pros. And so um, what I see down here in South Florida, um, sometimes, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to call any individual person out, but it's watered down. Okay. You know, and so... It doesn't always have to be where we have complete, total, 100% structure and we get out here and we do this. But um, my vision and my goal is to take basketball here in South Florida and make it actually something that people talk about, people want to travel to, get here. I have clients that would run through a brick wall for me. And I want that to be a situation where every single player in South Florida would do that and will bust their butt to become the player that they can be on the basketball court. Well, I think in other states it would be easier, right? So let's see the downfall because Florida produces football players and baseball baseball players, Mm -hmm. right? This is the mecca Mm -hmm. of young athlete or whether it's first or second biggest producers of pro athletes yes. like football and baseball so mm-hmm. basketball is other states right? yeah you want to make florida one of those i do i mean and, and and why you have athletes we have tons you of have them. tons of athletes and there are only so many baseball spots there are only so many football spots and it is changing i mean especially with the run that the, the heat had a few years ago basketball was really going to come up everybody wanted to be Maybe. LeBron James. Everybody wanted to be Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade, and they've always wanted to be Dwayne Wade for as long as he's been with the Miami Heat. Um, and it is changing, but uh, it's it it's not changing the right way. Okay. It's not changing the right way. Um, Let's talk about that for a second. What you have, what I've seen, are basketball coaches and basketball trainers that are either doing it because they're forced into doing it or they're doing it for the wrong reasons and the wrong motives okay and i do make a profit i have them i have let's get something straight we do a business yeah to make money yeah 
And if you make money doing your passion, it's not wrong. It's actually the greatest thing ever mm -hmm. if you get to do that. Yeah. There's a very small population of this world gets to make money doing what they love. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot of work, sacrifice, and determination to do that. True. All right? And, mm -hmm. and I think we're, we're very blessed when it comes to that. Yeah. Because I get to wake up every day. It might be early as hell, but I love it. Mm -hmm. I love what I do. And I'm going to continue to do so. But if I can make a profit and feed my family, yeah. support my community, mm -hmm. right, and become happier every day, there's nothing wrong with that. No. So there's nothing to be apologetic for. So I don't like when, you know, business or entrepreneurs are like, oh, man, I do make a profit. No, you're so Yeah. If you're an entrepreneur, the purpose is to make a profit. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. get that straight. Yeah. Okay. You, you, and, and, and the reason I preface my comments by saying that is some people will say, oh, you know, you're making money off of, you know, kids' sports should just be, you know. And I. Well, and, you, people want to volunteer? No. They yeah. got to put food on my plate. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what I've seen, it, it, the difference between what I do and what I've seen others is that the. Product. In the product. That's it. The quality. The quality of the your quality. product. Yes, yes. That's it. So if you're going to charge a certain premium your quality has to be great or what i've also seen is um we are not about the quality we're just about quantity let's just quality. get let's just let's just get that's a whole other yeah. business model let's just get as many kids on the court as we possibly can and we're going to have you know three four maybe five coaches and then you know each kid gets one shot every five minutes and then they're just standing right and then sometimes what i also will see again just just my observation this is all you know to each his own take it out yeah of will, right? exactly what i've also seen is they mistake activity for productivity mm, i like that so what I, yeah, what I see are just kids moving, but we're but what no are we intention. are we moving? Well, are we moving with a purpose? I don't want to just see a kid just moving on the basketball court. Now we're just we have activity going, but that has nothing to do with the actual action that you're going to do in a basketball game. That's not an action that you're going to do in a basketball game. You're just moving. Now you're just doing it for the sake of the audience that's sitting in front of you, which is your parents. I, if I'm going to have an action, if I'm going to have a movement for a player, it has to be because this is an action or this is a movement that you're going to use in a game. Or this is an action, this is a movement that's going to help you develop a particular muscle or something. Well, this so is what we're doing. Like, you see athletes like LeBron James and a lot are getting more into fitness and taking care of their body. Yes. And lasting longer careers mm -hmm. that other previous basketball stars haven't really focused on that. Yeah. They're just focused on skill. But now you're they're looking at fitness, strength, training. Mm -hmm. That before it was just like, I'm just going to get better at basketball. Yeah. So that's just the evolution of the game. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Now, the other thing I wanted to ask you is like, now I believe that basketball, it's not only the NBA. Like Europe, Europe, Europe ball is getting bigger and bigger. Yes. Asia. Asia is huge. It's Massive. a huge market. Massive. Right? That's, where my, that's where a lot of my clients come from. Or I, I have a lot of clients in Shanghai, Shenzhen, Dongguang. Uh, Hong Kong I, I, I have oh. all of it yeah and and I continually try to build that market if you can get a product where a billion people are going to like it are you kidding me like <laughs> obviously you know and I know there's a little bit of a controversy with you know, the NBA and basketball and so on and so forth oh, it's a different right, game right now yeah and and so um, you know the biggest thing that that I, again, myself and my coaching staff, we try to bring to the table is just is just quality, 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 quality. So I, uh, you know, the old the old saying, I'd rather measure ten times and cut once than to have cut ten times and only measured once. So I'm gonna do it the right way. I'm gonna make sure that I have all my T's crossed and my I's dotted before I decide to dive into something just because it's right there in front of me. I wanna make sure that, okay, if we're gonna do this, let's make the logistics are done right. Um, let's make sure that we have everything put in place as opposed to just, uh, somebody brings me an idea and somebody says something, all right, let's oh, just do it. Yeah. it. No, no, no we, 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 we gotta have quality because that's, 
what is only going to change the culture. That's only going to change the mindset down here. Is if we have quality, that's how we're going to make a difference, and that's how it's now going to be a basketball, football, and a baseball state. I love it. I think I'm going to end it with that one. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming. Man, I appreciate, I appreciate you, Hawk. <laughs> man, it's big time. Uh, uh, even though you called me short, but I love it. Oh, man. I, I, uh, well, if you make it on time next time, I'll, I'll let you pass. <laughs> <laughs> this 95 traffic, boy, uh, is something different. Leave it on 95. <laughs> Preparation. That's it. That's it, <laughs> my guy. That is it. All right, man. Well, that's, uh, that's the show, man. I appreciate you coming in. Until the next one. For sure. Guaranteed. Awesome. Yes.